Um, everyone, first off, let me just thank you for being here on behalf of MSPC and MS Investment Partners. I know it's a, it's early and it's certainly a Monday. And of all the people I want to thank, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, Shay Shatria the most. Shay is a director over at Russell Investments. He works on investment strategies as part of their global client investment strategies team. Uh, he's been uh, working with Russell since 2005 out of their New York City office. Prior to that, he was uh, working over at Brown Brothers Harriman. Um, Shay, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Um, and just uh, as just a, a general overview, we're going to be talking about financial markets and the election cycle. Now, uh, today, uh, from what I understand, we still have not had a concession uh, in terms of the presidential election, but we are going to go forward with these questions on the presumption that the president of the United States will be Joe Biden starting on uh, January 20th of, of mm -hmm. next year. Um, and thinking about that and Shay, now that the election is over, what can we expect from the markets going forward from here? Yeah, no, interesting, uh, interesting time, as you noted. And yes, we do have a few loose ends to sort of tie up as it relates to the election. But uh, it is quite interesting, um, especially if we think about what's going on with the market since uh, the election uh, time frame. It seems like there's a bit of a push pull if you if you see what's happened in the market and, and you compare that with the news flow. And what I mean by that is um, clearly the the uh, the market has shifted its focus um, on the virus as well as the vaccine so that's what i mean by a push pull on the one hand we know that there you know the cases are are rising and that's a, obviously a little bit disconcerting as it relates to current uh, economic conditions but then on the other hand and i think what really the markets are, are sort of keying in on um not that we've as you as you as you pointed out uh, michael that we're past the election the markets are really keying in on uh the hopeful news that have come out from the vaccine front we had pfizer uh, last week and then this just this morning um, I haven't really had a chance to look into it uh, closely but Moderna came out with some positive news uh, as well so um, clearly as we know the markets are um, always trying to price in uh, the market conditions to come the environment that we're headed into and the vaccine news is clearly uh, giving uh, the, the, the market sort of a positive uh, backdrop uh, for the time being, but I think that's that's what's going on right now, um, you know, as it relates to the market environment, at least. We've got a bit of a push pull, right, with, between the macro, the current macro, and uh, the projected macro per, uh, environment, you know, perhaps as we look into look into the future. Now, the fact that we're entering into what we're presuming to be a lame duck portion mm -hmm. of the Trump presidency does that play into this at all? Yeah, you know, the, it is an uh, interesting uh, time. And historically, you know, when we're at, at this sort of uh, phase of the market cycle, the election cycle, if you will, the last few months uh, before the new administration comes in or the next administration begins, um, and in this case, because we potentially could have a change in power, um, you know, we don't really expect a whole lot to happen. I think if there is one um, area that we are keeping a close eye on is uh, the stimulus. Again, you know, kind of um, getting back to what I was saying earlier with regards to current economic conditions, of course, with the cases rising and what have you, um, you know, having a little bit of stimulus, a fiscal stimulus um, uh, from the federal government would clearly uh, be a positive. And I think that's where, um, you know, we'd be kind of focusing in on with regards to any potential um you know action uh from uh you know from the administration but we doubt that there's any major uh you know legislation changes uh given kind of the you know you know the the, the period that we're in you know it just historically has been a pretty uh quiet time except for some you know, perhaps symbolic moves or what have you and um i just want to invite anybody who's joining us if you would like to pose a question to shay please feel free to type it into the q a box that should be available in the bottom center of your screen. Um, and again, uh, we're going to try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Now, Shay, a lot of people, including some of our clients, they made changes in anticipation of the election. I know that there's a lot of fear or uncertainty when you're entering into potential political change. Um, historically, is that a good strategy for people to follow? Uh, another uh, good question, Michael. And I think maybe what I'll do is, um, skip ahead to a slide here that might help uh, to address that question. I think, uh, you know, it's it, election 
time is always interesting. Um, you know, everyone gets pretty emotional uh, uh, when it comes to elections and what have you. But I think discipline is very uh, important. You know, oftentimes, you know, uh, investors do get a bit concerned as it relates to the election outcome and the potential impact uh, that can have on the markets. And and oftentimes, what, what you know, the concern tends to be around, obviously not the upside, everyone wants the markets to go up, but uh, the concerns are really centered around, well, will this election outcome impact the markets from a negative uh, perspective, right? Where we see uh, a, a major, perhaps a major decline in the equity markets or what have you. And I think that's where we we caution um, investors to make any rash decisions, just simply on um, the election themselves. So, you know, help to kind of address that question, Michael, what we have here is a slide that's illustrating um, the S&P 500, so the U.S. Uh, equity market, uh, which is the blue line. It's just a growth of the S&P 500 going all the way back to the 1930s up until the current uh, environment. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a growth chart that's probably familiar to many investors. It's just a, a long-term growth of the S&P 500. Um, and, and what stands out is obviously it is uh, up more than it is down. Uh, but we've actually done a couple more things with regards to uh, this growth chart where on the top there, what you'll notice is, um, you know, we, 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 we've listed the president that was uh, in, in power as well as their party affiliation. So blue, of course, would mean Democrat and red, of course, would be uh, would indicate that we, it was a Republican president. And in addition to that, what those black um, uh, parallel bars actually indicate are points in time when we've had an election, right? So we've got a lot of information here and then, oh, sorry. And then what, the one additional thing that we kind of uh, included was what those orange um, bars, they indicate a point in time when there was a recession. So again, a lot of information here. Maybe like, I'll quickly talk through it. So we've got the growth of the S&P, which we, we can tell it's generally um, going up, but there's some bumps uh, along the way. And when we, when we actually see the equity markets pull back in a, in a more significant way, what you'll notice is it tends to coincide with an economic uh, recession, right? So those major pullbacks or the, you know, the quote unquote bear market, if you will, that we see taking place um, with regards to the equities, it, it really does um, coincide with a, a, a contraction in economic activity or, you know, or a recession. Uh, and what's also interesting is then if you look closely at those recessions, what you'll notice is, well, we've seen recessions occur during uh, democratic presidencies, during Rep Republican presidencies, as well as we've seen uh, recessions uh, occur sort of um, in between, right, in the transition phase from one presidency to another, uh, as you've had a change in power. And what that tells us is that, quite frankly, recessions don't really discriminate with regards to which political party is, is, is in the presidency, right? It really comes down to more about economic uh, conditions, more so uh, than who is currently in uh, the presidency, uh, if you will. So I think so another way to kind of think about that then is, um, well, if if it's really not the elections or the election outcome that we're concerned with, um, what we're really concerned with is uh, perhaps a recession, which would cause a major downturn in the economic cycle. And what we would say, our you know general view over the next couple of years is actually pretty positive uh, for the business cycle, for the uh, U.S. economy as well as for the global economy. Yes, we do know there are some vulnerabilities. I kind of talked about, you know, that we, we, we know that we're still living um, with, with the virus and, you know, cases are rising a bit. So we know that economic data will sort of ebb and flow uh, as a result of that. But generally speaking, we are positive on uh, the economic uh, cycle, the, 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 the U.S. economy for the next couple of years. And that's in a large part because of, of where we are in the business cycle. We think that we're at the early stages of an economic recovery. So it's not an expansion, right? It is still an early recovery. And typically an early recovery is characteristic of low inflation. And because inflation is low, you know, except for the episodic spike here and there, you know, generally speaking, inflation is low. And because of that, uh, interest rates 
are actually uh, low as well. And in this time around, what we do know is the Federal Reserve, as well as many global uh, central banks, their counterparts um, have pretty much um, projected and, and, and informed us that they will be keeping interest rate low for an extended period of time. Uh, so low inflation uh, coupled with low interest rates. And then the other part of it is uh, just, just policy support. I mean, we're still talking about potential for the next tranche of a fiscal stimulus. We do know that uh, policy support will, uh, will remain uh, for some time because there are these vulnerabilities and given the shock that, that, that we did uh, endure earlier in the year. So we think, you know, when you kind of put all of this uh, together, it does keep us positive on the outlook for the next couple of years, which means that we don't really see a recession. Is there going to be volatility? Of course, you know, equity markets will always have some volatility um, that we'll, we will face, but we don't really see uh, a major pullback in the equity markets because quite frankly, we don't foresee a uh, recession being a high probability outcome. So therefore we are positive. So the concerns as it relates to now that, you know, the election has passed and a new uh, presidential, uh, a new president potentially will be coming in. And you know, what, what will that do for the markets? Uh, we would say that's a concern that investors quite frankly shouldn't have because what matters more than the election cycle is the business cycle. And, and on that, we do remain uh, positive, Michael. And not to get too political at this point, but mm -hmm. based on this analysis, can you tell us whether generally speaking, Republican presidents or Democratic presidents have been more successful in terms of economic performance? Yeah, that's another uh, good question and one that actually comes up quite quite often because even though we kind of you know talk about the longer term trends and and what have you there there's always a fair degree of skepticism that there might be you know perhaps an outcome that's out there as it relates to how the country is being run that could be negative uh, for negative for the financial market. So you know what we did do um, is you know we. It, it, what we tried to do was actually look at the data itself. You know, what does the data tell us with regards to how the country is being run? Um, you know, who's in charge of the presidency um, and, and, and as well as who's in charge or, or actually how, what the makeup of Congress is and what does that imply um, for market returns? So to help address that question, what we've done here was we've looked at the data again, look using the, uh, the S&P 500 as a sort of a proxy for the, the US equity markets going all the way back to 45, 1945 to the current environment. And what we've done is that we've looked at, you know, um, market returns, which is all what those percentages represent, market returns um, when we've had, uh, uh, you know, very uh, different parties in, in the presidency, but in addition to that, what we wanted to, to also take a look at is, uh, depending on the makeup of Congress, do we see a pattern uh, unfolding? So let me quickly talk through what we're actually illustrating here. What you'll notice is there's a lot of these uh, three initials in various places. And what those three initials are actually saying is the first one is indicative of which party was, um, is in charge of the, or was in charge of the presidency. So currently uh, the, uh, it's an R because it's a Republican. Um, the second initial there would be, well, which party was in charge of the, uh, the Senate? So by in charge, I, should, uh, I guess, you know, was the majority in the Senate. And currently, as we know, it's, it's also a Republican. And then, and, then, and then the final point being, which party uh, was the majority in the House? And currently that's a D, which is a Democrat. So, you know, that's the current makeup, but we looked at what all the different combinations that we can actually have um, along with the presidential cycles and, and, and what have you, what we find is irrespective of the outcome, you know, market, uh, the financial markets are positive and decidedly so, right? In most cases, we're, they're double digit positive. Now, the one uh, that I'll kind of get out the way right at the get go, because if you look at the bottom there, there is one um, combination that actually resulted in a negative return, minus 17%. And I, what I should also note is the number uh, that you see in parentheses there is the number of time that that particular outcome actually occurred. So what you'll notice is the bottom one, the minus 17%, there were two uh, occurrences of that. Um, and both of those occurred uh, af in, in 2001. So it was after the dot-com crash as well as after 9-11. So, you know, we would say that was a, a pretty different environment um, for the financial markets as well as, um, 
uh, you know, for, for for the for the country, it was in a sense the the exception, not the rule, right? And we didn't really have it was all you know occurred at the, around the same time, and there were only two occurrences. So if you put that uh, to the side, what you'll notice is returns generally are positive. Now, Michael, to answer your question specifically, um, we've got a lot of information here. So. Um, Democratic presidents versus a Republican president. I think that was your originally question, original question. And what you'll notice is, on average, um, a Democratic presidency has produced an average rate of return of around 15% um, versus a Republican, which has produced an average rate of return of around 12%. So both are pretty strong, um, but the Democrat uh, presidency has actually performed slightly better historic, uh, from a historical perspective, which is uh, also quite interesting. The other um, combination I think that's worth taking a look at is the situation that we may potentially have is once again a split Congress. Again, you know, loose ends to be tied up. We won't know for sure until all is said and done. But based on what it's seeming like at the moment, we might have a split uh, Congress. And if you'll notice, a split Congress outcome has produced an average rate of return of almost 14%. Again, slightly better uh, than the average. So, so far, what we can tell is based on history, you know, the combination might not be, should not be all that disconcerting as it relates to the, the to the outcome. Um, the one point I will kind of make right now um, is, and I can see you're smiling there, uh, Michael. Uh, maybe I'll preempt the question then. Is uh, the the combination that we may be finding ourselves heading into, which is a Democratic presidency, a Republican Senate, and a Democratic House you'll notice a zero, it's a goose egg. We've never had, so disregard the 0%, it actually should be NA because it's not applicable. From 45 to current, we haven't had this combination. In fact, I think you have to go back into the late 1800s to actually get this particular combination. Um, so it's been a while, let's just put it that way, since we've had this particular combination. So we don't really have a history from the period that we've actually uh, done this analysis that we could say what uh, history would suggest in terms of return, but if we do look at history and say that, you know, we have a, a situation where we have a Democratic president and a split Congress, both of those situations tend to coincide with returns, which generally are, are better than the longer term average. So again, looking at history, you know, the combination that we could potentially find ourselves uh, facing may not be necessarily a bad one. And more importantly, I think is again, where are we in the business cycle? I think that's first and foremost, and that supersedes the election cycle. And there, like we said, we do think that we're at the early stages of an economic uh, recovery, and it's gonna be a way, uh, some time before we get to an expansion itself. So you've got a bit of runway is another way to think about it, which is again, low inflation, low interest rates, tends to coincide with a fa generally a favorable, favorable backdrop for the financial markets. You know, Shay, a lot of people um, that have expressed concerns about a possible uh, Democratic presidency coming up relates to the changes or potential changes in tax policy. Hmm. And looking forward, how do you think any potential changes in tax policy will affect, you know, U.S. market performance, non-U.S. market performance? How should people account for that in their investment strategy? Yeah, um, that's a good point. And that is one that obviously we've also been kind of uh, uh, thinking about a little bit more with regards to one of the major changes, right, that could come down the line under uh, a Joe Biden presidency would be the potential for higher taxes. So actually, let me, um, yeah, so this is a good slide to kind of talk through that uh, situation. So higher taxes, of course, are, in a, are, are uh, something that we think about with regards to what impact it could potentially have on the financial market. So. We did take a look at it again, um, looking at what history would suggest with regards to, well, if we do um, enter a situation where taxes are, are rising, what has that historically uh, implied for the financial markets? And, and that's what we're highlighting in this slide. So there's a lot of information and I'll, I'll quickly talk through it. So the top chart uh, is actually illustrating uh, tax rates specifically for uh, individuals, which is the orange line, um, for corporations, which is the blue line, and then the maroon line there is the tax rate on long-term capital gain, okay? And then in addition to that, what we've done was the gray bars, what you'll notice, you'll notice what they are representing are points in time when 
either one or any combination of these uh, tax rates were rising. So we were, we're trying to hone in on those rising tax uh, environments. And so that's what we've got. And then the, the table on the bottom there is actually just giving you a little bit more information uh, from a numerical perspective and the years, specific years when uh, the respective tax uh, rates were, were increased. And the table there is obviously also uh, uh, telling us the return uh, that coincided with the, the, with the rising tax environment. So a couple of things that are worth, I think, pointing out um, right now, again, from a historical perspective, if we look at where tax rates are, and, and, and we know that President Trump cut taxes uh, a couple of years ago, but what you'll notice is that even before those tax cuts, tax rates, um, historically speaking, have been pretty low for the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, if you look at where tax rates were uh, back in uh, the 70s and 60s and, and prior to that, you know, we're, we're far from those levels, right? And even, um, and uh, so I think that's an important point, right? Historically, we're at a, a, at a pretty low uh, point in time uh, from a tax rate perspective. And, and, and even if tax rates do increase, um, under a Biden presidency, what he's looking at potentially doing is raising uh, taxes uh, slightly. By no means is he looking to actually bring taxes back to where they were, you know, in the in the in the higher tax environment of the '70s and 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 those er you know, from from that time uh, time period, right? So, what we know is that tax rates. What he's talking about is tax rates uh, increasing uh, modestly, but still. Higher taxes intuitively would then suggest that um, that can't be a good environment for the financial markets because if corporate taxes are going up, that that's a hit on corporate profitability. If individual tax rates are going up, well, that uh, hurts the individual's pockets and and the pocketbook and their ability to spend. But what's interesting is if you actually look at the data itself, um, with the exception of the, 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 the first uh, hike that you'll notice here in the early 1930s, which of course also coincided uh, with the dep depression time period, um, which higher taxes did result in a negative environment and taxes were increased rather dramatically um, at, in 31, 32. You know, if you kind of put that to the side, because again, it was a pretty uh, significant uh, hike as well as it occurred during the depression. So if you put that to the side, what you'll notice is other than that environment, when taxes have gone up, the markets have actually produced a positive rate of return, um, which again, seems counterintuitive, um, but it, the way we kind of think about it is, well, under what environment are generally speaking would taxes go up? Well, taxes will be increased at a point in time when the economic conditions are firm and robust enough that higher taxes won't impede uh, economic prosperity. Right, so higher taxes can actually be absorbed because the economy um, is in a firmer footing. Uh, that's, in a sense, yes, we're in an early recovery. Like I said, we're not in an expansion. That's really not the situation we find ourselves in. So even under a Biden presidency, we don't think that taxes are rising imminently. And now with the potential for a split Congress, that probably reduces the odds uh, uh, even more for tax rates um, going up over the next couple of years. Uh, so I think that's also an, another important point to kind of take away. But, but all that being said, if we think about the longer term, you know, when we start thinking about three, four years and beyond, we do think, um, sorry, I'm not sure. So I think we just launched a polling question. Oh, and uh, sorry, if you want to get continuing professional education, if you happen to be a CPA, uh, please answer the polling question and you will be getting uh, one continuing professional education credit, which from my understanding, most CPAs are pretty far behind on because of COVID. So <laughs> you can kind of uh, <laughs> put that in, in the, the rear view mirror to some extent and just kind of talk over it, check. Yeah, no worries. Well, you know what? It's comforting to know so far we're at 100% correction. So this is, this is a good start to the week. <laughs> Everyone's uh, engaged and aware. Okay, so maybe I'll just send the poll here if that's okay. I, yeah, I think that would <laughs> I be like it. I think, unfortunately, Shay, I think every day has been Monday for the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a bit of groundhog day. That is for sure. That is for sure. Uh, but hopefully this is a, um, well, let's uh, just hit an X there then. Well, you know what? It's a good start, 100%. We're good. Uh, 
which is not the tax environment or tax rate that we project anytime soon. <laughs> so that's also a good thing. Um, but well, well, speaking of you know taxes going up, then we do think that because of the fiscal situation that we find ourselves in, um, you know, with uh, due to the COVID impact and because businesses were shut down and in a sense, this was a forced recession, we saw a lot of fiscal stimulus and we're still talking about potential for more stimulus coming down the line. So, you know, deficits have obviously uh, increased rather dramatically um, in a very short amount of time. So, you know, at some point in time, um, we'll have to start thinking about starting to pay off some of these debts that are currently being incurred. Uh, so, Obviously, that means from a government perspective, uh, that means that raising revenue and what raising revenue means is, you know, and one way to do that, at least, is to raise taxes. So we do think that taxes will go up again. We don't think that's happening over the next couple of years. But once we start thinking, you know, a little bit beyond the medium term, we do think that tax rates could potentially go higher again, not like we had in the environment you know, back in the 70s or, or what have you, but, you know, modestly higher tax rates from where we are today is something that could potentially occur um, at a point in time when the economy, again, the key being the economy is a little bit more firm um, in its footing. So it wouldn't necessarily, and, and, and therefore we don't really necessarily uh, believe that that's, uh, a, you know, an automatic negative for the financial market as, as sort of this slide um, and the data here and analysis actually suggests. So, you know, Immediately, we don't think taxes are going up, but potentially at some point they may. But again, it shouldn't be something that clients should get, uh, you know, too concerned about um, based on what uh, what we've seen occur in the past. Now, along with taxes, I guess the other big issue people talk about in changes of administration are changes in trade policy. Hmm. For the last three and a half, four years, we've been engaged in a number of trade wars with other countries. We've been in high tariff environments. Um, what's your view going forward as to how the United States trade relationships with our partners will be changing over the coming years, um, tariff environment, and, and again, how, how should people react to, to that foreknowledge? Yeah, um, and, and obviously that's been a, um, you, know, a, you know, before we actually headed into uh, this whole pandemic situation, obviously trade was something that uh, was, you know, trade tensions was something that was, um, part of the market narrative for for several uh, years. Uh, you know, in, in, on the one hand, we think that, you know, under, uh, you know, a Biden uh, uh, presidency, you know, the trade, uh, th there's probably a little bit nor more normalization, I guess, if you could say, you could say with regards to, um, you know, relationship with uh, global uh, trading partners, perhaps less confrontational. Um, but um, but all that with all that being said, you know the key sort of trading um, relationship that the markets obviously has been focused on was with the U.S. and China. And there we also we would believe we would expect that there's definitely a, a change in tone, right? Um, that takes place uh, with uh, with the Biden uh, presidency. Uh, but we but, but but with that said. We don't really believe that there's a necessary uh, that that there's a change in policy coming down the line. Um, so you know, trying to uh, you know, I, I, we do think that there is going to be continuity in that sense with regards to the focus on trying to balance uh, trade to the extent possible. You know, the 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 you know trying to um, rein in on you know intellectual property and technology transfers and all those things that were part of the market narrative as it relates to US and China trade discussions, I think, you know, that'll probably stay with us and, 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 and probably be, will continue to be a point of discussion um, with the new administration as well. But what would probably change is uh, the tone and the approach um, versus the current administration. So I think that's, I think, a key, a key one to kind of uh, focus uh, in on. And then, and, and broadly speaking, you know, uh, a, a less confrontational approach as it relates to uh, trade with U.S.'s other tr uh, key trading partners, again, would not necessarily be a bad uh, thing for the financial uh, markets uh, at large. So when we kind of think about, you know, uh, trade relations uh, going forward, perhaps some normalization in, 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 in um, uh, the environment with our key trading partners, wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. And then you couple that 
with again where we are uh, in uh, the business cycle, which is an early uh, economic recovery. We think that you know from a market perspective, what we expect going forward would be a continuation of a recovery, and therefore that should also be beneficial for um, a broadening um, with regards to uh, participation of the financial markets. I mean, one of the um, what we know is that one of the key trends um, this year has been from a financial market or equity market perspective has been uh, the dominance of the larger cap technology type of names. Um, understandably, right? The reason we're communicating in the way we are um, helps to explain why technology has done as well as it has. But we do believe that as the recovery continues and it Shay, I, I can't hear your audio right now. I don't know if it's just me or Jessica, are, are you still getting Shay's audio? No, he is dropped here as well. Okay. Shay, can you see if there's something up on your side? I'm sorry. I'm going to mute him and unmute him and see if that helps. I think he just tried to toggle it on his side. Shay, can you see if you got that pop-up where it muted you because it detected uh, possible feedback? Check, hit all tab on your screen and just see if it's uh, if you have that that force mute from them. No. How about now? Oh, perfect. Thank okay. You, Oh, I'm not sure these, uh, here I was talking about technology doing well and you know, there you go, <laughs> it can go the other way as well. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, technology is great when it works as they say. So I do, uh, I apologize. I'm not sure um, where I got cut off, but so I think- So you had literally just said technology is doing well. <laughs> and you went, then you went dark. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh God, that's, that's very timely. Um, Right, so technology obviously has done well in a large part because of what I was saying was in a, in a large part because of the, the means how we find ourselves communicating, right? We're doing a lot more video conferencing, you know, using our devices a lot more, buying a lot more on Amazon. So all those trends have obviously accelerated and, 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 um, and helped uh, the larger cap technology themed names, Understand, understandably. But what the point we were trying to, what I was trying to make is that we believe the next phase uh, in the economic recovery will be one of broadening out of equity market participation. So that should that will be a healthy environment for U.S. equities because you'll see more uh, sectors uh, uh, contributing to the to the to the rally um, because the recovery gets a little bit more entrenched. A lot of those cyclical names that haven't really participated, like the financials, the industrials, the materials the energy names should start to do uh, a bit better uh, from our perspective, you know, as the recovery continues, obviously the vaccine will also help uh, in the recovery as well. And then because uh, if you think about, you know, US versus international, US equities obviously has done exceptionally well in the large part because of technology, which is, um, you know, has a high allocation in US equities. But the next phase of the recovery, as we get that cyclical rotation should also be beneficial uh, for the inter international space, which has a higher concentration relative to the U.S. in a lot of those cyclical sectors like the energy, the financials, and materials, right? So we do believe that, um, in a sense, a change of guard, which potentially in the presidency, which potentially normalizes some of the the trade tensions a bit, uh, coupled with you know the recovery getting a little bit more entrenched, getting additional support from the vaccine should help to support the financial markets at large and broaden out uh, the, the, the market participation um, within the US equities as well as uh, uh, regionally when we think about um, you know, across the globe. So 
that's how we kind of see the next phase of the recovery going and its impact on the financial markets. I think that's great. And again, I just want to thank everybody that's been typing in questions in the question and a uh, question and answer bubble. If other people have questions, please feel free to type them in and we'll, we'll try to address as many of those as we can. You know, Shay, earlier uh, on this call, you talked a little bit about the current situation for inflation and interest rates. Mm -hmm. um, now, looking at it in a, let's say, a medium to a longer term, how do you see those things changing in the upcoming years? And how should investors react to these anticipated changes in the interest rate curve and inflation rate curves? Yeah, good, good question, Michael. I think you, you put it um, correctly in the sense that, you know, over the, the, the shorter or medium term versus the longer term. And I think um, we kind of have to look at it through that lens when we think about inflation as well as um, interest rates, right, for that matter. Uh, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we do think that, again, we're not in a recession anymore. We are in an uh, in a, a early stages of an economic recovery. Um, and, and the reason why I keep emphasizing early recovery, because it's in, in just to uh, make the distinction that this is not an economic expansion, right? So we still have a long way to go before we're actually in a full on expansion where we've gotten back to what our potential, what the, what the economy's potential growth rate uh, would be. Um, we still have a ways to go uh, to actually get there, right? So typically when we're at that environment where, you know, you're still trying to get back or inching your way back towards what, you know, our potential growth is, um, there is a lot of e economic slack in the sense that needs to be uh, absorbed as we're recovering. So therefore, when we're in that phase where the recovery is just in a sense, absorbing um, a lot of the slack that currently exists, it's really hard to see inflation uh, run rampant. I think the best way to kind of think about that is, you know, look at our unemployment rate, right? Um, yes, it skyrocketed to almost 15%. In a matter of just about a couple of months, which was quite, um, you know, uh, remarkable when you think how quickly the unemployment rate shot up. Um, but we've actually had a pretty decent recovery in the unemployment rate as well, right? It's all, uh, it's around, it's under eight percent right now, but still, that's still well above the three and a half percent that existed pre-COVID, right? So we still have a ways to go. That there are still, you know, ten million or so Americans that are uh, out of jobs, right? So. It's hard to really see um, inflation becoming a major concern over the next couple of years, you know, two to three years even, um, while we still have a lot of the slack that needs to be absorbed. But when we start thinking further down the line, you know, three, four, five years down the line, we do think that the prospects for inflation um, starts to take higher. Uh, and, and when we think about higher inflation, again, we're not think, we're not um, trying to make a comparison to um, because automatically what investors kind of relate back to is the 1970s or what have you. We're not saying that, you know, that level of inflation, um, but higher inflation um, could be down the line, but that's again, um, several years, um, several years uh, uh, away. I mean, of course, with higher inflation, we can also, and, and, and that higher inflation, we also should keep in mind, um, will also be a reflection of an economy that's actually starting to, uh, you know, transition from a recovery to an expansion where demand is starting to outstrip supply and inflation pressures are, are building up. Um, so that's not necessarily, again, a bad thing. So at that point in time where we would actually start to see uh, interest rates also potentially move higher. But from, you know, where we are today, we don't really see inflation nor interest rates um, heading higher in a, in a material way uh, anytime soon. Perhaps it's a it's something to keep an eye on for, you know, two to three years down the line is, is, the, is the way we're thinking about it right now. Sorry. Um, and, and I guess that means that for people right now that are considering business expansions of one kind or another, mm -hmm. there's a high probability that cheap money will be available into the, into the, into the medium term. I mean, I know money has been cheaper now than at any time, I think in living memory, um, but, but the anticipation right now is that that will continue for at least a while. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head right there because that's precisely the intention um, uh, from the Federal Reserve. They want to keep interest rates low in order to 
um, in, incite e economic activity and 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 you know help business activity loan origin you know uh, having uh, businesses um, take on more loans to expand uh, their businesses uh, business activities and, and and what have you and reinvest in their businesses so the intention right now is to keep uh, financial conditions as accommodative as possible and 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 to do that, you need interest rates uh, to be low for, and as the, as the Federal Reserve has said, um, Chairman Powell has pretty much said that uh, the interest rates will be low for an extended period of time to, to bring that visibility to businesses that there isn't a risk that um, you know, interest rates will be moving higher uh, eminently, right? They wanna bring that predictability in a sense um, to businesses that rates will be low for an extended period of time. So therefore, if you need to take on a little bit more debt, uh, given um, the environment that we find ourselves in, um, you know, higher potential for higher interest rates should not be something that dissuades them uh, at all, because that is, um, you know, low interest rates are, uh, in a sense, helping to, to keep financial conditions fairly accommodative and easy. Shay, when people talk about cheap money. There's always this fear about the dollar losing, losing strength relative to the other major uh, global currencies. Can you speak a little bit about um, your vision as to how strong the dollar would be relative to those other benchmark currencies going forward? Yeah. Um, with regards to the U.S. dollar, uh, one thing we have to uh, keep in mind when we have a discussion on the U.S. dollar is it's also is always to kind of think about what the U.S. dollar represents. Um, on the global stage, and, the, and, that, and that is that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. So, as a result of that, because a lot of uh, business transactions are occurring in U.S. dollars across the globe, what that means is that um, the U.S. dollar is, in a sense, uh, what we say a counter-cyclical currency. So, what that means is that every time there is economic or financial market uncertainty, uh, the U.S. dollar tends to do tends to do well. And the reason for that is, again, straightforward. Because it's the world's uh, reserve currency and a lot of business transactions are occurring in US dollars, whenever there is this uh, an, an, an uncertain economic environment, obviously typically coincided um, with uh, recessions or what have you, everyone wants to get their hands on US dollar, right? So the demand for US dollar surges as a result of that. Um, and what that also does, because as the US dollar strengthens, because it is the world's reserve currency, um, it also um, inadvertently also actually a high US dollar also tightens financial uh, conditions uh, because a lot of global debt is denominated in, in the US dollar. Um, so a higher US or a stronger US dollar tightens financial conditions. So we actually find ourselves in an environment that's going to be the opposite of that environment uh, going forward. And, the, and, and what I mean by that is, again, getting back to our central view on the business cycle, we think we're in, a, in an economic recovery. So therefore, that stress um, that we were in, right, thinking back to March and April and, and that time period that we were in, um, where, the, where there was a scramble for US dollars and we saw the US dollar spike, we're now in a point in time where we think that um, the recovery will continue. Um, so therefore, the demand for US dollar won't be um, as strong, as, as significant. And therefore, the US dollar with the medium horizon, we actually expect it to actually um, decline uh, over the next uh, a couple of years. And, and that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. That just is another another indicator that would suggest that economic uh, global economic conditions are are actually easing, and that should actually support the global uh, recovery as well. Because again, a stronger U.S. dollar, in a sense, because it is the world's reserve currency, tends to tighten global financial conditions. So therefore, the opposite is also true, where we're actually recovering and expanding, and the U.S. dollar is weakening that should actually ease uh, global financial conditions and actually help in, 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 in the recovery uh, as well. So, um, you know, that's sort of our central view on the US dollar right now, which also, again, um, isn't necessarily bad from an investment perspective because that supports the global uh, recovery trade. Shay, I think uh, we're gonna leave it here. I wanna thank you so much for your time and. Uh, you know, Shay and the team over at Russell Investments, it's been very generous uh, for you to spend this time with us and uh, 
incredibly informative. So, so again, on behalf of everybody that's, that's here with us, I, I do want to thank you for your time and, and your insights. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And uh, my understanding is that a recording of this will be made available um, to participants on this call if they would like it. Um, that'll be available probably through our website in the upcoming days. If anybody has further questions for uh, anybody involved with this call, please feel free to email uh, MS Investment Partners and our team will get back to you uh, as soon as possible. I wish everybody a happy and healthy day and uh, a, a very good week. And I uh, hope to see you all uh, very soon. All our best.